The book of Proverbs, being God's wisdom book, is full of hundreds of concentrated, very practical uh, statements about how you should live your life. They are truths for you to meditate on. Do you know what meditate is, right? How many of you farmed or your family had farmed in, in the past history at all? You know, I, I, meditation is when a cow is out in the field and in one of those many stomachs that it has, put food before and brings it up and chews on it again. They chew their cud. That's exactly right. Okay? I'm not a farmer. I'm the son of one. But I know what it is when a, from science, from junior high science, when a, a cow chews its cud. The Word of God is like that. You need to meditate on it. You need to bring it up. It's not enough for you to hear some verse and be able to quote some verse. I know so people who can quote, quote hundreds of verses and, and know or live none of them. The Word of God here in Proverbs, these statements are given like orange juice concentrate. I mean, they are just so concentrated. And they are for you to look at and to meditate on and to chew on for to change your thinking and change your life. It's a tremendous source of reading, the book of Proverbs and meditation. When you're stuck in life, you don't know what to do. It's a window into the brain of God. We've just finished it's the first topic. Remember, we're looking at Proverbs topically. That means it's not expositionally. We're not going verse by verse by verse by verse by verse because uh, Proverbs is definitely shifting from this idea to this idea to this idea. Many times it shifts, as you remember, but in the middle of one verse. Remember Hebrew poetry? This is true and this is true. They have no relationship other than they're true. And some of you brainiacs try so hard to connect the two, the first phrase and the second phrase, not understanding that it's just the fact that this is true and this is true. Proverbs jumps around. I mean, it is the ADD of the 66 books of the Bible. It's here, it's there, it's everywhere. Tonight, as we look, I want you to look at Proverbs 30 and verse number 5. We plunge into a shorter segment. We begin with the author of the book, specific verses in the book of Proverbs that talked about God. And now we're hitting a, a shorter segment. We are going to look at those exact, uh, all those ver verses in the book of Proverbs that specifically talk about God's Bible, about His Word, about the Bible. Not limited to this single book of Proverbs, but all 66 books of the Bible, the complete Word of God. So let's look at what the Lord says about His book, about the Bible, and what it should do for our lives. What you see, the Bible says in in uh, chapter 30, in verse number 5, it says, Every word of God is pure. Wow, that's, that's, that's a pretty biased statement there. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. All right, tonight I want you to see that God's word is perfect and complete. It is perfect and Incomplete. There's not very many things on this earth that are perfect. There's not, you know, even when we talk about the gold that we have and those kind of things, you know, you realize it's not 100% perfect, don't you? Do you realize that the water that you drink, even that comes through the purifier, isn't 100% perfect, right? We would like to believe that it's perfect, but it's not. The Bible says here that the Word of God, however, is perfect and it is complete. Every Word of God is pure. Notice here that God, He is all uh, inclusive in every word of his scripture, he says it is pure. He vindicates, he protects, and he proclaims the purity of this book. This book is not like other books, folks. This book changes lives. This book is not like if you go to Borders or you go to Amazon.com and you look at other books. There are books that have greatly impacted the lives of men. Not anywhere close to this book. We need to look at it differently. Most of us have many, many copies of this book, and to us it's become kind of a mundane thing. You notice here in, the, in verse number 5, it says, Every word of God is pure. He makes a straight-out statement to some people that would look like God is pretty prideful about this book, and He is. He says it's pure. He wants you to understand what you're looking at. He vindicates and protects it and proclaims it, that this, every word here, is pure. We have the confidence that God was speaking Long ago, and up to this point, you realize when this was stated that the complete, it's, it's a big word called canon, but that's the complete 66 books of the Bible, that the complete canon of Scripture was not finished. It was being finished. And with confidence, he said at that point, and we have confidence to say about the entire Word of God, that every Word of God is pure. Every Word of God is pure. It's important that you know that and understand that. 
He has inspired, he has inspired and preserved the word of God to this generation when Solomon wrote this. But to our generation, we can pick up with confidence the word of God and know that it is inspired and preserved every word to us. It is a great confidence that should put fear and awe within us. And yet we treat our Bibles as if there's sometimes uh, something that holds down our magazines or our coffee table or something that you carry around looks spiritual, right? I was walking out of the uh, hospital uh, this week with my Bible under my arm. I mean, I'm a pastor. I visit people. And uh, the security guard says to me, you know, some people are afraid to carry that book. He says that to me. I'm shocked, all right? This is a special book. And it's true. It does something. Nobody would be afraid to carry a library book. Nobody would be afraid to carry the Webster's Dictionary around. But this book should instill fear and awe because every word of it is pure. It's different than what's... It's an alien book. It's not what is here. It is from God. We should have confidence that when we read this book that it came from the very lips of God. The Bible says in John 10, 35, listen to this phrase, the scripture cannot be broken. We have the guarantee that the word of God that we have in front of us is complete. It is here. We can look at it and have great, uh, great uh, confidence in our heart. God preserved the sound and accurate copies of the original books to this day that can be accurately consulted and translated into every language. Whether uh, it's one of our missionaries, I was, going to, I was going to point to Bauer. He's not there for one thing. And the other thing is that in Australia, they mostly speak English. So that's a bad illustration. Whether it's Dan Gardner in, in Japan that speaks Japanese, they're able to have the precious word of God accurately, accurately translated into their language. It's a wonderful promise to have every word of God being pure. It's amazing that we have every word of God and God provided for it. Notice that each word in uh, each verse, according to this phrase, is pure. Now, what does that mean? The word pure re refers here, as I looked it up in the scriptures, it has a lot to do with the ring that I'm wearing. It dealt with the smelting of metals by extremely hot fire to produce a very pure substance. But I know that I love my sweet honey, and I know she bought me the best ring that she possibly can. But I know that it's not 100% pure gold. I know that there are impurities because they can only get it to a certain point. I want to tell you, God does not have the limitations that the metal workers have. The word of God is perfectly pure. When you read these book, you ought, this book, you ought to fear. When you sit down with it in the mornings, when you hear it preached from this pulpit, you ought to fear. It is the words of God. And how often are we uh, Yanni uh, uh, Christians that we've heard it so much, it's just like, you know, like uh, candy corn to a kid on Halloween night. I mean, it's just whatever, you know, again and again, and you have hear it again and again and again. That's a bad illustration. I don't support Halloween. I just want you to know that. But I want to tell you it's a bad illustration, but you understood exactly what I mean. We, we, we are gluttonous because we have the Word of God. We're not like those in some parts of China that would, that would take their life uh, into their own hands to have a copy of the Word of God. It's pure. The word means smelting, like a, a, a met metals that are refined by the purifying of fire, gold, silver, other things. When you come to this book, you must realize that God has not given you any junk. It's not for you to pick and choose which verses you like. I heard one guy heard one time that said only the verses that are in red, they are inspired. Well, you understand that, that the publishers choose to put the words of Jesus, print them in red. When Jesus was talking, it didn't come out in red. <laughs> That's kind of a joke, okay? Please understand, all the book is inspired. Verse number five says, every word of God is pure. And when you come, what have a great comp you should have a great confidence when you put this book on your lap each morning that, and read it and start your day that what, what you're doing is you're getting alone with God's words. Come to this book, it's, there's no junk. It's not junked up with the thoughts of men. That's what I mean. It's pure. But it's a very God speaking to you. When I open this book in the morning, I have no thought of whether this word or that word or this verse or that verse is junked up by the thoughts of men. I believe what God has said, and I believe that it is the word of God. And that makes me fear a little bit. And that makes me know. I know who is there in, the, in my living room when I'm sitting there in the morning. I know who it is. It's not just me and that ugly cat princess. It's me and the Lord. That's who it is. It's me and the Lord. The Lord is talking to me. He's sharing with me by his pure, wonderful words. That's something precious, precious appointment. It did not come, the scripture says, by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You should fear as you come to this book. It's a wonderful thing. Bible words are perfect and clean and truth. And that's in contrast, if you look there again in verse number 5, every word of God is pure. That's in contrast to what you and I know. It's in contrast to our thoughts. I have some good buddies, and they share some good advice with me. 
But sometimes their advice just trips me up. You know, when you come to the Word of God and you base your life on that foundation, it will never trip you up. In the long run, it will always be proven true. You can know that if you base your decision on some verse of this Bible, it will be right. Now, that's good. That's good. Men always want something, you know, beyond, knowledge beyond. You know, voices from Mars. We heard them on a radio. Beep, 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 beep. It was voices from Mars. We want something beyond. I had a dream and, and we're all this beyond. This is beyond. This is beyond the thoughts of men. This is God's pure book. When you come to it, look at it that way. Purity is a fact in this verse. This book is reliable to furnish your life for every test and direction and decision. The word pure, again, it is pure. I want you to understand what I mean. I'm not, the, the God doesn't use this word pure just to throw out there as if you to know, know pure is synonymous with something that's good, something that is all right, something that you should be confident in. It means it's not messed up like your brain. It is clean and pure and perfect because it's from the brain of God. These words are God's thoughts, and God is always right and he's always good. And so when you read that, you need to understand it is pure because it has come from heaven. This book is not an earthly book. Over and over there are scriptures that I could quote. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's not by, it is not by the interpretation of men. Uh, uh, there's no prophecy of scripture, the word of God says, that is of any private interpretation. That means it was never brought by men. It was always God. There are other verses in the Bible that back up this proverb about the purity of the Bible. Listen to Psalm chapter 12 and verse number 6 and 7 that talk also about the purity of this book. All right? The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. That's great. It is about, you know what was odd to me? It sounds very much like this verse. Okay, verse number five, as we're looking at, every word of God is pure. Well, listen to the verse in Psalm 12, 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. That is awful close. Do you know what's strange about that? It sounds so close because you know who wrote that? The, the man named Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs. The man who said the verse I quoted to you was his daddy. His daddy. Of course, these words are under inspiration. But I want to tell you where Solomon learned that this was God's pure book. He learned it from his daddy. It was David who said that the word, he said first, and Solomon knew it. Dads, if this generation is going to know that this is what we need to build our life upon, daddies, you're the one that's going to teach them. Their school is not going to teach them. Don't put it on Pastor Valiente as a youth director to expect him to teach them. You ought to be teaching your child as I teach my child. The Bible is the word of God. This is God's book. There ought to be a precious, this is a pre the most precious thing in your house. Not, the, not just the paper and the cover and the ink. I don't mean we worship the book. I mean we worship what God says in the book. We worship the Lord. We take the words and we apply them to our life. You understand what I'm saying, right? It's a responsibility just of the daddies, like David taught Solomon, so teach your children that the word of God is pure. Notice the next point there in verse number five. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Many times in Proverbs, as I told you at the beginning, the phrase that comes after a proverb, or there's a, a phrase A and a phrase B, and, and it makes up one verse. I'm not trying to confuse you, I'm just telling you. You know, it'll say da 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 da. And then it'll have a comma or it'll have a, a, a semicolon. And then it will be da 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 da. Okay? Many times they will not be connected to each other, but they'll just be both true. I was looking at this today and meditating on it, thinking about it, and thinking about uh, is this attached or unattached to the first sentence? Well, if you look down at verse number six, you see that God picks up right back at, up or picks up uh, right talking about his words again, add thou not unto my his words. And the middle phrase is sandwiched between two phrases that are just talking about the word of God. So I figure the middle phrase is talking about the word of God too. And I think that that's good exegesis. This thought is connected in some way. Well, why would God put in the middle of a discussion about the Bible verses, why would he all of a sudden come, come out with, he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. It doesn't really sound much like 
talking about how pure the Bible is or anything else. I think the point is this. Putting your trust in the Lord is inseparable from following the pure words of God. I know a lot of people that say I'm trusting in the Lord that never follow this book, never read this book, don't care a flip for this book. And they say, oh yeah, I'm trusting the Lord. I'm trusting the Lord. Trust the Lord. Boy, that's easy to say. Don't tell me you're trusting the Lord if you're not, your nose is not in this book. You're not trusting in the Lord because you don't know what he says. How can you trust what you don't know? I mean, that's, I'm, not, I'm not real smart, but that's true. How can you say you trust? How can my children trust me if they never listen to their daddy? And how can you trust the Lord if you never listen to what he's telling you? Well, I just got this warm, fuzzy feeling in my... Yeah, that's called heartburn. Okay? Got a warm, fuzzy feeling. You say you're trusting him in decisions and tragedies and times of life to be your shield and to go before you. You must realize that it's impossible if you're not directly following his words, his directions, and his commands. It's not just... Trusting God is not just a matter of a feeling. It's a matter of obeying the scriptures. God will never lead you contrary or, contrary or without the anchor of his word. In fact, fellowship and trust on God can never be outside his word. It's in his word. Listen to me. Have you ever met anybody that talks about uh, how much they love the Lord and how much they want to follow the Lord, but they seem like, it's a, they seem like what they're telling you is completely divorced from this book? It's not anything based on any scripture that they're living their life. It's not based on any stories of the Word of God of how somebody failed and so they're not going to do it and they're following the Word of God or basing their decisions on Bible verses. It's just this idea as if God was somehow different from His Bible. These are His words. This is where you find Him. This is where you fellowship with Him in the Bible, not outside in some, under, some, under some oak tree on some hazy hot day of August. This is the place that you find the Lord. This is the place where, when reading a passage, He tells you what to do in your life. He guides you. The New Testament does not teach us to follow omens or even what some people may call open doors or feelings or felt rights. You know what felt rights are? Why'd you do that with your life? Just felt right. Felt right. I know people that gamble because it feels right. They knew that... 6699732 ought to be the lotto number for the day. It felt right. It felt right. I know people that make the most foolish decisions because it felt right. I got a phone call late this afternoon from a young lady who we had in our youth group for many, many years. Her father died and we became kind of her parents. And uh, I won't go into all the story, but the fact of the matter is she is engaged to a fella who is uh, divorced and wrongfully and it's a bad situation and... Uh, She's probably going to marry this fella. I asked her if she felt, I didn't ask her if it felt right. I asked her if she thought that was the right thing, according to the Lord. She said, yes. There's only one problem. It doesn't agree with the word of God. God doesn't lead you in a position over here that he does not tell you right here in these words. Is there anybody that can say amen to that? Do you agree with that? Yet, yet so many Christians practice that omenism, and I just felt like God wanted me to do it. Well, what, what passage were you reading? What principle are you standing on? And we, this felt right kind of Christianity has got to go out the door. The Word of God is sufficient. It thoroughly furnishes us into all good works. Not our own felt rights, all right? Uh, the Word of God here, when, he, when this phrase is sandwiched, He's a shield unto them that put their trust in Him, it's sandwiched between the idea of the Word of God is pure and the idea of don't add to the words. You trust in the Lord by following. He is a shield when you trust Him because you've trusted His words. You've followed, you've based your life on the words. Several Christian people I've known have told me things like this. I feel like God wants to me, me to, and this is, these are real things. I hate to tell you this. I feel like you know, God wants me to work as a bouncer in a bar. Someone told me that. Okay. I'm not making fun of that person. I'm just telling you that God didn't want him to do it. I don't have to wonder. I don't have to pray about that. God don't want you in the place of sin. I don't have to pray about that. I uh, had one tell me this. God wants me to leave my husband because he wants me to be happy. Well, that sounds great, doesn't it? Except that God told you not to leave your husband. All right? God wants me to move my family, and they didn't say this, but this is, a, this is the whole idea, to a place where there's no good church or no Christian pe people for fellowship, and basically I can't serve him. I'm just out in the wilderness, but I'm going to make a lot of money. Okay? I have a hard time believing that God, that God would go and, and lead you in a direction that's contrary to his word. He won't. 
God's will will always parallel His Word. It never contradicts it. I believe that's the idea of the second phrase. Trusting God to be your shield in real life looks like following behind the first phrase, following behind the pure words of God. You're searching for the pure words of God, and, when, and you find them, and you believe those pure words of God, and He is a shield to you because you believe what He said to do and what He said to believe. His promises are pure and trustworthy, and you can believe them. There's some people that kind of, they, they, they live their life like rolling the dice, and maybe sometimes they'll listen to the principles of God's Word or the verses of God's Word or what He says, direct commands, and other times they won't. And they, it's like they're teeter-tottering on the idea of whether they can really trust God or not. Can I tell you tonight you can? Can I tell you that you, really can, you can really make decisions based on your family's well-being on this book? You can really base decisions on a story that you see in the Bible and the way that it turned out and what God wanted a certain man to do, like we preached on a lot on Sunday night. You can really make decisions of your life based on this book. And I want to tell you, hundreds of years, thousands of years have proven out that it is right and it is good and it is true. And God will not let you down. He will be your shield. This, this verse says, a shield. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. If you're not trusting him, you're not listening to him, but you're listening to your own gut, you're making a great mistake. You listen to the Lord God by keeping your eyes on the pages of the Bible every day. Look, please, at the last phrase. It says, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. This is very close to another uh, verse, two verses that are just like it, and they are found in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 18 and 19, about adding to the book of Revelation. And it says, you remember, if whoever adds, you know, we're preaching through Revelation, so you're, this is really going to make sense to you. He that adds or takes away from the book is asking for the plagues of the book upon him. That's pretty heavy duty when you consider, can, you think about the plagues we've talked about. You ought not add to the book. This is God's word. Every word of God is pure. From the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, the word, the word of God is exactly what he wanted it to be. It was, it's complete and it's perfect. You know, this definitely should be applied to those that pervert the Word of God. Please understand there is a lot of perversion, inaccurate copies and inaccurate translations of Scripture that are perversions. It should be preached against also against the charismatic crowd that say so quickly, God told me this. You know, listen, if God told me this and told me this and told me this, you ought to write it down because it's a completely different Bible, okay? And when you have a preacher who says, God told me this, and he comes out with something, especially when he says, God told me this, you need to write out a check to my ministry. You ought to say, whoa, <laughs> I don't think he told you that, all right? People that throw around so quickly the idea of God told me this, ought to read this verse, add thou not unto his words. But I don't believe that those two things about Bible perversions and, and, and the charismatic crowd that say that God told them things is primarily what Solomon had in mind when he wrote this. He was writing to individuals like you and I, to those in his kingdom that needed the word of God. Under the inspiration, he had individuals in mind. He had individuals in mind that would add their own thoughts to God's word so they could do what they wanted to do in life. Wanted to do in life. You know, a pastor told me one time that education and religion, let me say it this way, everyone is a professional at two things. Education and religion because everyone has a, an opinion that they believe is right. Do you know that that's not true? Do you know that only what God says is right? And when you add to his words or skew his words so that you want to live your life the way you want to, verse number six says that he's going to reprove you. Add not to the wor his words lest he reprove you. God told me to do this. You better not throw that phrase around in your own life. So many people have made decisions of their own life of, uh, uh, that have been major decisions based on that thing. And, and they say it so freely. God told me this. You know, I'm scared of that phrase. I want to tell you that. I'm very scared of that phrase. You know what I always say? I believe the Lord would have me do this after I prayed about it and looked at the principle of the word. I believe, you know, don't you be thrown out there God's words. Uh, don't be so quick to say that God told you to do something. Make sure that it's in the book. You had better be sure that, he want, uh, that what he wants you to do comes from sound Bible, not your own instincts or desires or even your own imagination. Men add to the word of God in other ways. Are you with me? I know this is Wednesday night, but if you're with me, say amen. amen. We're almost done. We're almost done here. 
God or men add to God's word and violate this, this verse, verse number six, add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. They do it in other ways, wrong applications, interpretations of scripture. You know, one of these my, my brother is dealing with, with, and if you're in the church of Christ, I love you very much, but there's a terrible heresy in the church of Christ, and that is that, that uh, baptism some, that somehow adds part to your salvation, that it is necessary. The thief on the cross had a very strong problem, if that is true. And the, the theology of the New Testament is very clear. A man is saved by the grace of God, by believing, by faith, and uh, that Jesus Christ was given as a gift, a free gift of grace. And believing on that, that's how a man gets saved. You can't add water baptism to that. That's just telling people that you got saved, showing people, identifying. That is adding to the Word of God when you add things like that. Another way men add to the Word of God is, and let me just say this, interpretations. A wise preacher told me one time, if you're interpreting a passage and you see it the way, a uh, completely different way that many other godly men before you have seen it, and you see it in a completely a new light, please understand that you're probably wrong. All right? Use other scripture compared to scripture to interpret the word of God, not just some harebrained idea that you have. I've heard people turn around verses. I got one in the mail today. Open the word of God, and there, or open the word of God. Man, I opened the letter, okay? And it, and it was an advertisement for something, some product or whatever, and he had twisted a Bible verse to sell his product. And I'm like, what is this? And I knew the verse too. And he had twisted it around, so it kind of made sense to the product he was selling. Come on, guys. That's adding to the Word of God. That's, that's crazy. You're going to be reproved for that. God's going to hold you responsible. Let me tell you something other, another way that men add to the Word of God. When they make their traditions or their religious habits become sacred. We must remember that historic church methods are fine and they are good the way that a church does something for umpteen years, but they're not God's word. You know, the methods of the Bible, you follow what the, what the Bible says about a New Testament church. And just because you ain't never done it that way before, it doesn't necessarily, if it doesn't violate Bible principle, it's not bad and sound. But what kills me is when you do a tradition for so long that it becomes sacred to people. We have, a, we have a, a, a little thing where you can give stamps to the countrywide prison ministry back there. Let's just say that we let that back there for 25 years, all right? And I'm dead and gone, and another pastor comes, and he decides he don't want it there. He wants to move somewhere. You can't move that. We've had that there for 20. That sounds funny, doesn't it? But how many of you know of churches where stuff like that happens, all right? Things become sacred. All right, listen, only the word of God is sacred. Very quickly... First, our first ministry, there was a, a multi-level, a three-story education building. And on the second story, there was a room that was, I've told you about this, and some of you even know the name of the room. It was called the Coleman Booster Room. And when I heard that, I was like, who's Coleman? What is, what's he boosting? But it was a man who had died and left an amount of money to the church. A certain group of people in that church got that control of that certain amount of money. They set up their own account. They had set up their own Sunday school class. And they were like something I don't understand in that church, like a cult or something in that church. That room was sacred. You couldn't move things from that room. That was a Coleman Booster room. You could hear, could you hear the humming? Oh, it's Coleman Booster room. I mean, it was something that became sacred. Listen to me. What, the word of God is something that's sacred. And when you try, when we start adding traditions and the think that things that we think the way that things should be done to that then we we start really adding to the word of God okay we start making our own traditions as important as the word of God yes we follow principle yes we follow New Testament uh, methods of how the New Testament church began but let's not make our traditions on the same plane as the word of God there's another way that men add to the word of God and that's by telling others that God wants them to do something when he does not anybody ever tell you that God wanted you to do something? You know, this is kind of common in church when people are just, they, they're mean and good. You know, but don't be the Holy Spirit in somebody else's life unless you're just giving them straight scripture. Let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. As a pastor, sometimes I try to be Superman and I realize that only the Holy Spirit can change people's lives. I can't be God to those people. There's many a pastor or deacon or a good intentioned Christian that has said, God wants you to do this and do that. And I imagine the Lord God is saying, did I really? When, when did I do that? I don't remember ever telling that person to do that. Let us be careful. The verse says that God will reprove us for adding 
and we'll be found liars. Maybe we'll have to have a donkey come and reprove us like Balaam when he misrepresented the word of God. Some of you know your Old Testament. This is a promise rebuke. Look again at verse number 6. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. The solution to verse number 6 is the first phrase of verse number 5, getting into every word of God that is pure and loving every word. I don't want to leave you with the curse, though. I'm going to leave you with the middle phrase. And this is it. One more time, and we're done. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Okay, here's a promise. There's a strong promise there. We know that he will be a shield if we trust in his pure words. It is a resting place for your family. It's a resting place for your life. We believe, he says, it'll take care of us. It'll never leave us nor forsake us. And a hundred other promises. You need to know the promises by getting into the book and believe and know that God will be a shield to you. This week we've dealt with some strong people that are having strong problems. Both of them have one thing in common. They're putting their trust in the Lord. Bessie Pruitt is putting her trust in the Lord very vocally and by very sound steps that are based on Bible principle. Okay? The Singleton family, the Bogger family that we were with today are the same way, putting the trust in the Lord. In fact, I want to share something with you. I don't particularly want you to go gab it around, but I want to show you because I want to wrap up the message with this about this promise that he's a shield to those that put their trust in him and how powerful the word of God is. Okay, here's Janet and Bush. Janet just lost her sister last night. And we're sitting there, and frankly, uh, please understand, there's hardly any right thing to be able to say in a situation like that. You just have to be there and try to sympathize the best you, best you possibly can. As we're sitting there, Janet looks at me, and, and she says this, and I'm, I want to tell you, it was, it was powerful. She said this. She said, Pastor, you preached on Sunday out of Revelation that we need to praise God in the blessings and the cursing. And we are praising God. Man, do you remember that passage in Revelation about the martyrs and the angels praising God for his judgment? That, folks, is placing your trust on the Lord God who will be a shield to you. That is a very real-time illustration of resting on the word of God. The word of God is pure. He's a shield to those that put their trust in him. Would you bow your heads tonight?